So in this part of the lecture, we'll look at the reading and um, set the scene for the task that I've asked you to look at. So Hayden's article, I think, gives lots of specific examples and some of those we've talked about in the, in the uh, middle part of today's lecture. But I think probably the most important idea in this reading is his overview of how we might sequence activities and his argument that there is a logical way to plan to engage with interpretation. That's important when it comes to planning a whole scheme of work or getting the overview established for a topic and it really resonates with the earlier lecture in um, education studies last term where I was talking about the alignment stage in the five A's model for medium term planning. If you can remember that I was saying that it's important at the outset to be able to articulate what you wanted to get from this scheme of work um, to then align the different learning steps so that you move from where the students are at to start with to where you want them to get to by the end then you think of activities then you assess them and then you adjust your plan in the light of that assessment information so this alignment stage is really important so we have to think about where we'd put interpretation work in a sequence um, in an overall sequence of learning so here's um, the the view from um, this first art, uh, chapter uh, in a nutshell that we might start with teaching about knowledge of the topic then at the second stage we think about knowing about the different interpretations and maybe coming up with our own interpretations based on close reading of the relevant sources then we can come to some kind of comparative level where we compare the interpretations between themselves and we compare them back to the um, the evidence and the knowledge of the topic we have. We can also then start to think about the context in which the interpretations were made. So if you think about uh, the picture of Lady Jane Grey from the 19th century, we have to be aware of that and we think about what people in the 19th century would have been doing creating images of Lady Jane Grey and what purpose it served for them. Only when you've done those first three levels can you have a hope really um, of thinking about how we'd explain those interpretations and we can't evaluate them until we're able to explain them and understand them in context. So there's a very logical sequence here and clearly what um, Hayden and his colleagues are saying is the knowledge comes first. You can't really on this view teach knowledge through interpretations. Now uh, that's an interesting point and I think there probably is an argument to be made that sometimes interpretations can be so interesting and engaging that we might use them as a way up front to teach the knowledge but certainly in this chapter they're making a point that um, life's much easier if you want children to eventually come to judge and evaluate interpretations that you put some knowledge up front and I think that's probably broad, broadly true and even if you took that alternative perspective and you put interpretations up front you'd be doing it to engage and draw children in and then you would have to teach some of the content subsequently before they could come to an informed view about how accurate an interpretation that was. So Foster's article, the second one, is interesting I think because it charts one teacher's attempt to use historians interpretations in the classroom and um, I think most important really if you just kind of try to um, extract from her detailed analysis of what she did in the lesson most important seem to be these principles that she couldn't have done this unless she knew a lot about this topic and she was um, quite knowledgeable about the different interpretations and the different debates that were emerging in this field so it's a good argument I think for teacher knowledge and a very good argument that you can't do this work unless you spend a lot of time and effort thinking about the kind of sources that will be useful and accessible to children. So the second thing it's a useful reminder of is that we need to plan activities to give students access to the text through, as I mentioned in the second lecture, directed activities related to text. The third thing that's important in Foster's work I think is that her recognition that there are also conceptual obstacles to accessing a text. So it's not just about literacy and reading and understanding the vocabulary of the historian, but there are some deeper conceptual issues. But finally, she says, even that's not enough to understand what's going on when a child encounters a text like this. She says that we need to address the fact that children address, sorry, we need to address children's underlying perceptions of history. This is a recurrent theme through lots of the lectures so far. 
but I think it feeds into our need to plan. So here's an example from um, an article on planning. Uh, this is from Science, actually, Leach and Scott. They said that a really useful way into um, planning is to identify, first of all, what the school science is that's going to be taught. Then consider how that area of science is conceptualised in the everyday social language of students and then identify the learning demand by appraising the nature of the differences between one and two. So if we think about that approach to assessing learning demand in relation to Foster's conclusions, we can see that one problem in her article is the everyday meaning children bring with them erroneously to the history classroom. So they bring certain understandings of um, this terminology around argument and opinion. Now, the school subject, so what we want in history, is for them to understand the argument as the connection of a series of statements linked by a line of reasoning to establish an intellectual position. Whereas in everyday social language, children are likely to think that argument is a quarrel, possibly a heated quarrel, there might be animosity, arguments are largely undesirable in schools and are often punished. So arguments are not things to be embraced, they're not productive, they're examples of what happens when relationships break down. And similarly with opinions, what we want in history is for, for opinion to be seen as the intellectual and personal perspective adopted by a historian in a debated field and within the reasonable constraints of the evidence. Whereas in everyday social language, opinion is an individual response to which I'm entitled. It's quite common to hear children say, I'm allowed, to my, I'm allowed my own opinion. You can't tell me I'm wrong, it's my opinion. So I think what Foster's grappling with, but not quite articulating in this way, is that some of the children she interviewed about the work she did in class are still using this terminology in everyday social language and they're trying to apply it in history. So if we think about the gap that Foster has revealed between her students' understanding in social language and what they're bringing in and what we want them to be able to understand in history, then we can approach something um, to, or, or some kind of definition about what the learning demand is. So around the concept of argument, we want children to understand that the meaning of argument in history is the identification of evidential steps within a broader logical construction which leads from the evidence to a reasonable interpretation. This interpretation may be tested by appeal to the use of evidence, the reasonableness of the interpretation and the logic which links these steps together. Historians need to construct arguments because facts do not speak for themselves and because we have questions of history which are about meaning, not just about establishing the facts. So really when we come down to it, what Foster needs to do in the next uh, attempt to teach this scheme of work is to engage much more explicitly with learning objectives around defining and understanding what historical argument is. And similarly with opinion, um, she needs to try and help the children understand that opinions are not merely personal whims or ideas but that they represent historians attempts to construct a coherent stance in relation to the material with which they're working. Opinions can be judged according to the evidence and the reasons given for holding them. So a historian can't say, I'm allowed to my opinion, don't pick on me. An historian has to provide an opinion, justify it, and then open it up to debate and be prepared to revise their opinion if someone has um, identified a flaw or has a, a more strongly founded argument to make. So I think what Foster does is indicate some of the problems if we don't tackle um, what's distinctive about history and how it fails to relate to the everyday social language that children bring with them. So th that, that's just my reflections on the, uh, on the reading for this week and no doubt you'll have other responses. So the task for this week is to look at a scheme of work where a focus on the construction of narrative or the analysis of an interpretation has been planned or where you think it could be planned, where it might be appropriate. And then outline how you would do that using ideas from the reading and the lectures and specify what resources you might use to help you do that. So not in detail here, but I'm thinking about are there films or are there documentaries that you could use? Are there um, contrasting textbooks or magazines or websites that you could use that would set you up for an investigation of different interpretations? So that's the work for this week. 
Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what sense you're able to make of this as an area of uh, history education and how this links in with at least one scheme of work in your school. Um, here's the, the, the additional reference to that science article. Um, should you want to follow up on that, let me know and I'll be able to send you a copy through. But if not, I'll look forward to seeing your response on the website and we'll continue the discussion about interpretations and narratives there.